Hello everyone, welcome to Cellblock Chronicles. Please subscribe, like, comment, and share our content. Pablo's home was a small ramshackle hut on the outskirts of town. The roof leaked when it rained, and the walls were thin and brittle. His father had died when Pablo was very young, a victim of the violent clashes that often erupted in the area. His mother, a weary woman with tired eyes and a gentle smile, did what she could to make ends meet. Pablo was too young to understand why strange men often visited their home, but he knew it made his mother sad. One day, Pablo returned home to find his mother lying on the bed, her face pale and covered in sweat. She coughed weakly, her frail body shaking with the effort. Panic seized Pablo's heart. He rushed to her side, his small hands fluttering helplessly. Mama, what's wrong? He asked, his voice trembling. His mother opened her eyes and smiled weakly. I'm just a little sick, Pablo. I'll be fine. But Pablo knew better. He could see the pain in her eyes, the strain in her voice. He knew they didn't have enough money for a doctor, let alone medicine. Desperation clawed at his chest as he thought of what to do. He couldn't lose her. Not her too. The next day, Pablo went from door to door, begging for money. The neighbors, familiar with his plight, gave him a few coins but mostly sneered and laughed at him. Some threw stones, others spat at his feet. With each rejection, a burning resolve grew within him. He couldn't live like this. Couldn't spend his childhood begging and being ridiculed. Late that night, as the moon hung high in the sky, Pablo made his way to a seedy part of town. He had heard whispers about a local gang, a group of men who lived by their own rules and had more money than anyone else in Rio Negro. Pablo's heart pounded in his chest as he approached their hideout, a dimly lit building at the end of a narrow alley. A burly man with a scar running down his cheek stood guard at the door. He eyed Pablo suspiciously. What do you want, kid? I want to join the gang, Pablo said, trying to keep his voice steady. The man laughed, a harsh, grating sound. You? You're just a kid. The man's expression hardened. He sized Pablo up, then nodded toward the door. Minutes later, Pablo was ushered inside, where he faced a group of rough-looking men seated around a table. The leader, a man with a thick mustache and cold eyes, leaned forward. So, you want to join us, eh? One of the men, a wiry figure with a cruel smile, suggested giving Pablo a gun. Let's see if the kid has what it takes, he sneered. The leader shook his head. No, he's too young for that. But we can start him with something easier. He pulled a small packet of white powder from his pocket and tossed it to Pablo. Take this. Deliver it to the address on the note. Don't get caught. Over the next few months, Pablo became a familiar face within the gang. He started with small deliveries, sneaking through the shadows and evading the authorities with a skill that surprised even the seasoned criminals. As he grew older, his tasks became more dangerous, his reputation more notorious. The name Pablo Escobar began to spread through the streets of Rio Negro, whispered with a mix of fear and admiration. As the years went by, Pablo's operations grew more sophisticated. He transitioned from marijuana to cocaine, recognizing the immense profit potential. He built relationships with powerful figures in the drug world, learning from them and planning his ascent. By the time he co-founded the Medellin cartel, 10 years later, he was a master of his craft. One evening, Pablo stood in a dimly lit warehouse on the outskirts of Medellin, surveying the cargo ready for shipment. The faint hum of machinery filled the air as workers moved with practiced efficiency, loading crates onto planes bound for the United States. The scent of gasoline and metal mingled with the acrid smell of cocaine, and the walls were lined with maps and charts, tracking their distribution network. Everything ready? Pablo asked, his voice calm and commanding. Planes loaded with cocaine flew under the radar, while submarines quietly navigated the waters, evading detection. Corruption was his greatest weapon. Colombian police officers, officials, and even judges were on his payroll, ensuring his operations ran smoothly. He returned to his hometown, erecting a sprawling mansion that stood in stark contrast to the humble homes around it. One night, as the town slept under a blanket of stars, Pablo set fire to the homes of those who had laughed at him, those who had thrown stones and spat at his feet. The flames roared into the sky, casting an eerie glow over the town, 
and the air was thick with smoke and the acrid scent of burning wood. But his display of power did not go unnoticed. The Colombian government, alarmed by the rampant spread of cocaine and its devastating impact, decided to crack down on the drug trade. The United States, facing its own epidemic, joined forces, determined to put an end to the flow of drugs. One night, as Pablo sat in his lavish mansion, a sudden explosion shattered the tranquility. The ground shook, and the air was filled with the deafening roar of gunfire and the acrid scent of smoke. He rushed to the window, his eyes widening at the chaos unfolding below. Half the town was engulfed in flames, bullets flying in every direction. The sound of sirens wailed in the distance as rival gangs clashed violently. The night sky lit up with sporadic bursts of gunfire. In the aftermath, as the dust settled and the fires were extinguished, Pablo stood among the ruins. The Colombian and U.S. governments had declared him a narco-terrorist, a title he wore with a twisted sense of pride. He relished the notoriety, the fear his name invoked, but he knew his enemies were closing in. The government formed a special police unit, the search block, dedicated to capturing Escobar. They hunted him relentlessly, their determination fueled by the support and resources of the United States. He knew the game had changed. The search block was getting closer, their operations more precise. The walls were closing in, and Pablo could feel the pressure mounting. Pablo Escobar, now a figure of global infamy, struck a deal with the Colombian government, a prison term in exchange for no extradition to the United States. The thought of languishing in a U.S. cell, stripped of his power and influence, was unbearable. He would never allow himself to be taken from his home soil. But Escobar had no intention of enduring the harsh conditions of a standard prison. Instead, he built his own luxurious fortress, La Catedral, perched high on a mountainside. The so-called prison was more a palace than a penitentiary. With 20 toilets, 15 bedrooms, and a panoramic view of the lush Colombian landscape, it was an opulent testament to Escobar's power and wealth. The construction had been shrouded in secrecy, and when the public got wind of its extravagance, they were outraged. Escobar, however, was unfazed. He continued to live like a king, even behind bars. The public's outrage was mounting, and the government, under intense pressure, was planning to transfer him to a regular prison. A place where his power meant nothing, and his control over his empire would be shattered. He couldn't let that happen. As the first stars began to twinkle in the night sky, Escobar made his decision. He would escape. The next day, under the cover of darkness, he summoned his most trusted lieutenants. In the dimly lit interior of La Catedral, they huddled together, their voices low and urgent. We need to act swiftly, Escobar said, his voice steady but laced with urgency. The government will move against us soon. We can't let them take me to a regular prison. His men nodded, their faces grim with determination. Plans were laid out, routes mapped, and contingencies considered. The escape would be perilous, but failure was not an option. The night of the escape was moonless, the sky a vast expanse of darkness. The guards, loyal to Escobar, orchestrated a distraction, creating chaos and confusion. Under the cover of this manufactured bedlam, Escobar and his men slipped away, navigating the secret tunnels that led away from La Catedral. The next morning, the prison was in an uproar. Escobar was gone, and the news spread like wildfire. The Colombian government, humiliated and desperate, launched a massive manhunt. The search block, the elite police unit dedicated to capturing Escobar, was mobilized. Rival cartels, smelling blood in the water, also joined the hunt, hoping to claim the bounty on his head. For weeks, Escobar evaded capture, moving through the dense Colombian jungle with the agility of a predator. He relied on his network of informants and loyalists to stay one step ahead of his pursuers. But the net was tightening. The search block was relentless, their operations becoming more precise and coordinated. One fateful evening, as the sun set over the sprawling city of Medellin, casting long shadows over the rooftops, Escobar found himself cornered in a dilapidated safe house. The air was thick with tension, the distant sounds of gunfire echoing through the night. His men, armed to the teeth, took up defensive positions, ready to make a last stand. Escobar, his face a mask of grim determination, fired with a machine gun, his mind racing. 
He knew this was the endgame. The walls were closing in, and there was no escape this time. He fought with the ferocity of a cornered animal, each shot a desperate bid for survival. As the smoke cleared and the gunfire ceased, the search block moved in, their expressions a mix of triumph and exhaustion. The infamous Pablo Escobar, the man who had terrorized a nation and built an empire on blood and drugs, lay dead in the rubble of his last stand. Thank you for watching. Check out our channel for more cell block tales.